On Saturday, the IDF staged an electrifying raid that saved four hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. And guess what? The world condemned it. I'll have all the information coming up on In Focus. So on Saturday, we received the electrifying news that four Israeli hostages being held uh, in Gaza were rescued by Israeli commandos from the Israel police's Yamam unit, along with uh, essentially the entire IDF uh, on the, at 11 o'clock in the morning, more or less, at Nusrat camp in central Gaza. Um, the hostages who were released include 26-year-old Noah Argamani, uh, 21-year-old Amog Mayor John, 27-year-old Andre Kozlov, and 40-year-old Shlomi Ziv. All four of them were captured from the Nova Music Festival on October 7th. They were being held in captivity by uh, by the people of Gaza in support of Hamas for eight months and one day. Um, they were uh, rescued in an incredible mission. Uh, the three men were held in one building 200 meters away from the building that Noah Argamani was held in. Noah Argamani, of course, was an iconic symbol of the atrocities that Hamas carried out because they filmed her capture where she was uh, distraught. Here you see it uh, on a motorcycle uh, being taken to Gaza. Her boyfriend, uh, Avinatan Or, was taken along with her. They were hiding and they were found. Uh, in the bushes uh, and uh, along the sides of the rows of the uh, Nova Festival, um, and uh, we haven't heard from uh, or about and or received word from Avinatan or since he was taken healthy, uh, walking uh, by his captors on October seventh. Um, so the uh, commandos carried out this raid simultaneously by day, you know, in broad daylight to maximize surprise in Nusrat. The men were held on the third floor of one building. Noah Argamani was held on the first floor of the other one. The element of surprise worked completely with Noah, and therefore she was rescued more or less without incident, and she was uh, uh, evacuated by IDF helicopter along the seacoast uh, back to Israel. The three men, um, their captors, I don't know, they had more advance notice or something, and uh, uh, during the course of their rescue, the leader of the rescue raid, Israel police uh, commando, uh, commander, 36-year-old uh, Arnon Zamora uh, was killed. Uh, Zamora, the father of two children, uh, lived on uh, Stedavid Moshav uh, in the south, not far from Stirot. Uh He was also engaged in uh, the uh, fight, uh, heavily engaged on October 7th in the fight um, uh, to push back the Hamas invaders first at Kibbutz Yad Mordechai, which was uh, saved, rescued by Zamora and by the uh, by the team at the Kibbutz. They killed uh, dozens and dozens of terrorists who tried to enter the Kibbutz, prevented them from entering the Kibbutz, prevented a major uh, massacre at that Kibbutz as well. And, and more importantly, perhaps, uh, you know, in the larger picture, uh, he was involved in blocking Hamas from moving north of the Yad Mordechai Junction. He then went down to save uh, uh, civilians and kill and you know combat the Hamas terrorists and civilians who had invaded and seized control over the Kibbutzim Nachal, I mean um, uh, Kfar Aza and Be'eri. So he was an incredible hero, an incredible hero. The, the uh, Operation was renamed in his memory. It's called Operation Arnon. He's going to be buried today in the afternoon at four o'clock in the military section of Har Herzl Military Cemetery. Um, and his memory should be for a blessing. Um, so the four hostages were held in these two apartment buildings. And so Zamora was uh, killed. And when they were evacuating him and the three men, to the car waiting. The car got stuck. I'm not quite sure whether it was just a mechanical problem or whether they were shot at because 
they were heavily attacked by the people, civilians, all around inside of the camp by RPGs, by rifles, by grenades. Um, and uh, an armored personnel carrier had to come and evacuate them to the seacoast where they were, uh, where they flew home in a helicopter. And, uh, and um, the helicopter itself, or several of the helicopters up in the air, uh, one of them was attacked with a missile. It was trying to intercept the, miss the helicopter that was evacuating them back to Israel. Thankfully, it missed the target, and they too were able to get back to Israel within an hour. So the entire operation lasted an hour, and despite the fact that the evacuation of the male hostages uh, was difficult and held under fire, and you had massive operation by the Israel Air Force, there were 10 uh, combat jets in the air providing a ring of fire to protect not only the hostages and the rescuers, but also uh, the forces on the ground, armored forces, commando forces that swarmed the area in order to protect them and evacuate them safely into Israel from when the rescue vehicle got stuck. So that was a major combat operation, very, very messy, but thank God uh, it was successful. And as Prime Minister Netanyahu said, it was a uh, a uh, hair's breadth from a between separated uh, success and disaster. And thank God he said, I, uh, I trust our forces. And when they provided me with the operation for approval on Thursday night, I realized how risky it was, but I trust them. And we should remember that uh, the 1976 Entebbe operation to rescue the hostages that were held by uh, Palestinian terrorists and German terrorists at uh, the Entebbe airport was conducted, was commanded by the Prime Minister's older brother, Yoni Netanyahu. And Yoni, like Arnon Zamora, uh, was killed. He was the only IDF uh, officer killed in that uh, stunning operation back in 76 because he too led the forces in the rescue operation. So I'm sure that there was a lot of mixed feelings also for the Prime Minister. But he, uh, as his his brother and, uh, and as the man responsible for the hostages and rescuing them, uh, he, I think, rather courageously approved this uh, raid, despite the obvious uh, risk of failure and disaster for the forces and for the hostages themselves. And thank God he was right. Uh, it paid off. It was a calculated risk because our guys are just so awesome that you can trust them with this kind of thing. And so that's where we are. Um, and so this is obviously a major morale booster for the public. Um this is really good news, and we're facing, as I was talking about last week, an incredibly dangerous situation in the north where we're likely to have to go into a major conventional operation in Lebanon to push back Hezbollah to save northern Israel from total destruction at the hands of Hezbollah rockets and missiles uh, and drones that are essentially destroying the landscape of the north, uh, hitting house after house after house. Over a thousand homes have been destroyed by Hezbollah bombs since October and major military facilities and assets have also been destroyed by Hezbollah's bombing. And so it's true that Israel is carrying out counter-bombing raids in Lebanon, but obviously that's insufficient in order to enable the life to go back to normal in, in northern Israel. So we're facing this. We still have 120 hostages, 79 of whom are assessed as alive still uh, in Gaza that we have to free. But it was, for the Israeli people, a major morale booster and also a demonstration of capabilities that, you know, this is the third uh, rescue operation that has brought hostages home alive. The first one was in late October that uh, IDF forces rescued Oli Magidish, one of the female soldiers that was taken hostage from Nahal O's base on October 7th. And two um, older men from one of the kibbutzim were rescued in February from uh, Rafiah. All of them were held in civilian structures. All of them were held by civilians. Um, and that's where I want to get to now. So when we're assessing the implications of this raid, you know, people have said, look, this is a tactical success. It doesn't have strategic implications. We still have 120 hostages, 79 of whom are assessed to be alive, being held by Hamas and Gaza. It's possible that their conditions will be uh, will be worsened uh, in response to this. Um, we'll have to see what happens. But Obviously, this is not a mission that's been accomplished yet. We still have to bring the rest of the hostages home. We still have a lot of work to do in Gaza. Operations continue in Rafah and in other areas of the Gaza Strip as we 
uh, seek to push back and destroy Hamas's remaining battalions and capture their their leaders, destroy their regime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in and in the north, so it was a major morale booster. And thank God we brought these people home. Um, but it also exposed certain aspects of uh, Gaza society, of the Palestinian society more broadly, and specifically the Gaza uh, health uh, health ministry health system that I want to highlight today, and also the media. And uh, and so I want to look into those things a little bit more directly and what we're seeing. So. On uh, Sunday morning, I, I received on my feed this update that is from um, it's a it's a tweet by a guy named uh, Rami Abdu who says in his byline on Twitter that he is a uh, professor or an assistant professor, and he is also the chairman of Euromed HR, a uh, Euro Mediterranean, I think EU funded organization that's supposed to look into human rights in the Mediterranean area. And if you look at Rami Abdu's Twitter feed, it's filled with photographs of children who he claims Israel is killing and atrocities in Gaza. So um, he had a really interesting tweet that I saw on Sunday morning in which he writes the following. In an initial testimony documenting the killings by the Israeli army at Nusrat camp today, the Euromed HR reported that the army used a ladder to enter the home of Dr. Ahmed el-Jamal. The army immediately executed 36 Fatima el-Jamal upon entering her, uh, upon encountering her on the staircase. The forces then stormed the house and executed her husband, journalist Abdallah el-Jamal, both of them 36, and his father, Ahmed el-Jamal, who is a physician, in front of his grandchildren. The army also shot at their daughter Zainab, who sustained serious injuries. So Abdallah al-Jamal is a photographer for Al Jazeera, and his father, um, Ahmed al-Jamal, is a physician in Gaza. All right, so why the army only entered two apartments. One was the apartment holding Noah Argamani, and one was the apartment holding Amod Mayor John Andre Kozlov and Shlomi Ziv. Okay, so there were only two apartments, which means that the apartment that Abdu is uh, saying that we entered and killed all of these fine, upstanding citizens, that those fine, upstanding citizens, uh, the, the 36-year-old journalist, his 74-year-old uh, physician father and his wife, um, they were holding hostages. They were, you know, Israel Ayom reported that they were holding Noah Argamani, um, and then the Palestinians rejected that. I think that the fact that they had to go up the stairs and that they were maybe entering through a ladder means that they might have been holding the men because the men uh, were held on the third floor of an apartment and Noah Argabani was on the first floor of an apartment, but, but who knows, because it might have been a first floor walk up at any rate. So what they're saying is that these fine upstanding citizens, a physician and his journalist son, were holding an Israeli hostage or three Israeli hostages in their private residence, okay? That means that they were accessories to a war crime of holding hostages. This is an atrocity. They carried out an atrocity every single day that they held the either Argamani or the three men in their apartment. And we're being accused of massacring them because they were killed uh, while they were holding hostages. So this is important, obviously, in and of itself, but I just want to look for a second. This is not the first instance that we've had of collusion between physicians, in this case, the father, who is a physician who is holding either Argamani or the three men in his private residence and Hamas. So in the uh, first tranche of uh, hostage releases in the hostages for terrorists deal that Israel concluded that brought the children out, except for the Bibas children and um, and many of the women, um, one of the hostages related that uh, she or he or they were held by a teacher who worked for UNRWA and that they he, would, he starved them. He held them in his own apartment. He had 10 children. They were hidden in the attic. And in another instance, the same reporter, Almog Boker, 
who is one of the most credible reporters in Israel, um, he reported that also among the released hostages in November was a hostage who was held by a physician in his home, was a pediatrician, and that he treated children uh, in his clinic in his home while starving this hostage uh, in his attic. So this is so we had first the UNRWA teacher, and we also had a doctor that was holding that was holding the hostages in his home uh, and starving them while you know going about his business and taking care of his his patients in Gaza. Um, and then we had another instance in May where we had Ori not Ori Megidish, we had um, Noah Marziano, 19 years old. She was one of the female hostages who was taken hostage at the Nahal Oz base on October 7th. So just like Ori, Marci uh, Ori Magidish, so Noah Marziano was shown in a Hamas clip uh, alive, uh, pleading for her life, and then dead, right? And then um, the IDF forces who entered Shifa Hospital in November in May found her body in one of the buildings in the hospital compound. So Noah Marziano, the Hamas claimed that she was killed in an IDF bombing raid, but what the IDF found was that her body uh, was riddled with bullets, which is, of course, uh, not what you would find on a body that had been blown up uh, in a bombing from the air. Wouldn't find bullet holes, wouldn't find bullet wounds. And second of all, she had evidence on her body that she had been thrown from a great height. So it's possible that she was shot to death and then thrown out of a window. Um, her family told the Jewish Chronicle in London that the person who murdered her was a physician at Shifa Hospital, that she had initially been wounded in an IDF bombing, in the IDF bombing of uh, Gaza City, and that she was brought for treatment in Shifa Hospital, and rather than treat her, the physician at Shifa shot her to death and then threw her out her window. So that's a third instance that we have of medical personnel uh, either directly implicated in holding terror, uh, hostages or in the case of um, Noel Marciano of killing a hostage. Um, so this is... This is this is very important information because, of course, it, it calls into question. Um, I don't want to say the credibility, the the nature of the Gaza health system, because it shows that at least in these three cases, you have physicians who are directly involved in Hamas's terrorist complex, and they're embedded inside of it. and And this assessment is buttressed when you look at the way that the Gaza Health Ministry has been producing on a daily basis casualty numbers that have no bearing on reality. And, uh, you know, they say that 70% of the casualties are females or children and that Israel is wantonly, wantonly killing them. These these data, by the way, have been cited by as credible by President Biden in his State of the Union address, by Vice President Kamala Harris and by other senior American officials. Um, and cited repeatedly as credible by the U.S. media, by NPR, by the Washington Post, by the New York Times, by all the major news uh, news channels, uh, networks in the United States and in Europe, and, and so on and so forth. So the Gaza Health Ministry says, you know, 70%, 70% of the hostages are... Um, 70% of the hostages are, I mean, 70% of the Gaza casualties, sorry, are men, are women and children, and that Israel is wantonly killing all of these people. So we cited a, a study that was published uh, in Tablet Magazine by a statistics professor at University of Pennsylvania that showed that the, the numbers don't make any sense, that they're sort of on a graph that keeps going up, and uh, it, it doesn't matter how much combat is going on anywhere or, you know... Um, whether there are women and children in the vicinity, then the numbers make no sense statistically. Um, and then in this month's commentary magazine, uh, David Adiznik, Adiznik or AIDS, AIDSnik, and Kevin Chang wrote a piece called The Gaza Health Ministry Flim Flam and uh, noted that in early May, the UN quietly halved its own casualty numbers of women and children. Um, the State Department uh, defended the health ministry's numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the one industry, one important thing that we learned here, well, I mean, there were two important things that we learned from the health ministry data. So the health ministry in Gaza, which is controlled by Hamas, and everybody acknowledges it, but pretends that it's not important. Uh, the health ministry of Gaza numbers show um, 
that uh, claim the health ministry claims that its numbers are based on hospital data and but largely based on media reports and the media reports in Gaza are brought by people like the journalist who is holding uh, uh, either the three men or no Argomani hostage in his own home right so these are the media in Gaza and uh, they're the ones who are who are doing all of the uh, gathering of data they work for Hamas they are Hamas terrorists they are embedded in Hamas's terror complex. And so the, the U.S. media, the European media, the Australian media, and of course the Arab media, the world media credits these numbers and use them as the basis for uh, incriminations, indictments of Israel, not only in the court of public opinion, but also at the U.N., the ICC, the ICJ, where we're being criminalized as a state based on data from the Gaza Health Ministry. So what they found was, uh, so the, the numbers are just, what has come out in recent weeks is that the numbers are just made up. So here in the commentary article, they cite a man named Michael Spagat, a Harvard-trained economist who teaches at the University of London and works at an organization called Action on Armed Violence, a British NGO that records, investigates, and disseminates evidence of armed violence against civilians worldwide. So initially in October, Biden had said that, well, actually, there's no reason to credence the numbers that are given out by the Gaza Health Ministry. This was after uh, they claimed that 500 civilians were killed in an IDF bombing, an IAF bombing of Al Ali Hospital in northern Gaza. And then it worked out that, no, uh, there was no bombing in the hospital, that it was an, an Islamic Jihad missile that had fallen short of its target and that it fell in the parking lot of the hospital. And who knows how many, if any, uh, people were killed, but whatever the case may be, Israel wasn't involved in the incident at all. Um, so at that time, Gaza, I mean, uh, Biden had acknowledged that the Gaza Health Ministry data were untrue, and then he was attacked by uh, by people in his administration and the State Department were all angry and up in a, you know, they, they got all upset because he was uh, saying that Hamas wasn't a credible actor. Um, so then he took it back, and then they then the administration completely embraced the uh, Gaza Health Ministry numbers because they didn't want to get in trouble with a progressive base or because the progressive base is the administration or whatever. Um, but then, you know, then in April it came out that their numbers, that they themselves acknowledged that their numbers were basically, you know, horse duty. Um, and so Spagat had been attacking Biden for uh, placing doubt on the credibility of the numbers in, in October. And then he, in April, he, he released his analysis of the Gaza Health Ministry's list of fatalities. And that was an updated list that they were sort of correcting, trying to, you know, correct the fact that they had been lying all along. So he found that among the fatalities that they listed, 440 were duplicate records, 470 of the records had no ID number, 79, uh, 792 records had ID numbers with too few digits, and 1,486 records with ID numbers that had correct number of digits were invalid for other reasons. Another 219 entries provided no age for the deceased, and all he found 3,400 flawed entries that were 15.7% of the total. Um, but then he also had some sharp words regarding the ministry's lack of transparency. He writes, roughly 13,000 deaths that have been apparently entered into an unavailable database using an unknown methodology. He also noted the off-sided claim that 70% of the Gazans killed in the conflict are women and children seems increasingly untenable. So says that, and then he goes, then the authors go on and say, in the ministry's list of fatalities, women, children, and the elderly are 67, 61% of the total. If one looks at all the individuals with, in, with valid ID numbers, the figure drops to 53.3%. So they've gone from 70% to 53.3%, to and the data themselves are garbage because they don't have, they don't really have data on almost anybody who they're claiming that they have data on. So that's, that's, um, that's the flim flam from the health ministry, which is controlled by Hamas. And here, you know, we have to realize that Hamas itself is embedded inside of the health ministry in other ways. For instance, you have uh, Rantisi, uh, he's in Abdel, or Mohammed, Mohammed Rantisi. He was one of the co founders, along with Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, of Hamas in uh, 1987. And he was a pediatrician, in, in addition to being a terrorist. He was killed in 2004 by. 
an IAF uh, uh, Bami. Um, and he was one of the, you know, terror masters of of Hamas going back to 1987 when he fought, when he established it. He was a pediatrician, and you have the Alran TC Children's Hospital, right? Just like the pediatrician who was holding a, a terrorist, uh, you know, hostage in his home and treating children in his clinic in his home at the same time. Same thing with Alran TC. He took care of kids while he was planning and organizing suicide bombings against Israel in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. So this is. This is the, the the nature of the beast with the Gaza Health Ministry, with the Gaza Health System. And yet you have this health ministry, this health system funded by UNRWA, by the World Health Organization, by the EU, by USAID, uh, by all the major uh, relief organizations worldwide, which are funded by taxpayers in Europe and the United States and so on and so forth. Their data are credible. In the it, are, cre are are credited as accurate by the U.S. State Department, of course, by the EU, and so on and so forth. And here we see, you know, just yesterday, and in general with the health ministry's data, that they're just lying in the service of Hamas, of which they are integral parts. Whether you're physicians or you're the health ministry itself, if you are controlled by Hamas and you support Hamas, which they clearly do, because they're holding hostages. Right in collusion or murdering hostages, in the case of, in the case of uh, Noah Marciano, um, they are colluding with Hamas. They are part of Hamas. They are terrorists. Okay, that's who they are, and that shines a very clear light on the way that the entire international community is the role that the international community, whether it's the Arab world or the Americans or the Europeans or anyone else are playing in this conflict. They are sponsors of a health system that is an integral part of Hamas's terror regime. Okay, that's an important, important and critical factor that we have to take into account when we look at the nature of the war that's being waged against Israel. The second important thing that we have to understand is the role that journalists play in this conflict. We've already seen since October 7th that journalists from AP and I think from the New York Times, um, and now we see from Al Jazeera, they are terrorists. And and in the case of the earlier reports, I think it was put out by Honest Reporting, you had you had um, photographers who were photographing from inside of the kibbutzim while the slaughter was being carried out in the kibbutzim. They are members of Hamas's terrorist army. Some of them are officers in that army, and they also work as journalists. So the West credits their journalistic reports from Gaza or from Israel, as the case was in October 7th, on October 7th, when they were joining the Hamas murderers and the Gazan murderers, the civilians who came in and murdered 1,200 Israelis, took 250 Israelis captive, right? These were they were adjuncts. They were members of the force. They were carrying out PR during the atrocities. And then they cover the atrocities that Israel is supposedly carrying out in Gaza uh, since, uh, since the ground operation began and even before it began with the air raids inside of Gaza after October, 8, after October 7th. So they are actual Hamas terrorists, like the Al Jazeera reporter who was, or photographer, who was holding either the three men or Noah Argamani in his apartment, along with his physician father, his wife, his children, and his sister, apparently. So they're all in this one complex holding Israeli hostages, which is a war crime, which is a crime against humanity, right? And they are integral components of Hamas's regime in Gaza. And it's not only in Gaza that we're looking at this thing. You know, on Jerusalem Day, which was last Wednesday, you had tens of thousands of Israelis who converged on Jerusalem. Some of them, many, many of them, the overwhelming majority of them are teenagers who uh, come to Jerusalem with their high schools. And and then they either they come for the day, like you know, my son, who's in ninth grade, he came with his high school here in Efrat, and they went to the Kotel, and they prayed, and they marched around and you know, heard stories about the liberation of Jerusalem in 1967. And then my son and several of his friends stayed for the afternoon when you have the flag parade where the where the participants marched from Western Jerusalem 
uh, around the walls of the old city and then enter uh, the Damascus Gate to go to the Western Wall, where then they uh, pray and they dance and they sing for hours afterwards until, you know, in the, in the evening hours. So this is an incredibly joyous day, um, marking, you know, the the fulfillment of a dream of Jews for 2,000 years when uh, we restored our sovereignty over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is, of course, the center of Jewish nationhood and, and Judaism as a faith since the time of Abraham, because Mount Moriah, where the temple is located, where the Temple Mount is, is where Abraham was uh, commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. So since then, it's been the center of Jewish identity, Jewish faiths, and uh, Jewish nationhood. And uh, we liberated it from Jordanian occupation. So the left in Israel and the international media for years has been trying to um, demonize the celebrations of Jerusalem Day. And, you know, you have 100,000 people coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the day and to participate in the march, etc. cetera. Um, and they always find these... Um, images of Israeli Jewish uh, teenagers attacking these innocent Palestinians. And so we had this happen on Jerusalem Day, obviously this year, as it happens as a matter of routine every year. So in one of the photographs that made the rounds very prominently online, and then in the media coverage the day after, you had a picture of like, I don't know, uh, many uh, Israeli teenagers from one yeshiva, I don't know which one, surrounding this Palestinian uh, who had a journalism vest on, and one of the boys is kicking him, and the rest of them are looking at him angrily. So it works out that this uh, journalist is named Saif uh, Kawasme, and Saif Kawasme, uh, the, the Kola UD, um news news service in Israel, they wanted to find out who was this guy that everybody says was, uh, you know, just this innocent guy that was being attacked by this uh, group of Israelis. And so it works out that he is a Hamas terror booster at a minimum. He's had his, he's, he, all of his Instagram and his social media f is filled with him praising terrorists from Hamas who are pr imprisoned in Israeli jails, including, you know, his uncle who uh, he took a picture of himself holding his uncle's a uh, photograph, it's this guy's name, I'll tell you, let me just find it. I have it here in my papers. Here it is. His, uh, it says, he has a picture of himself with a relative mass murder named Akram Kawasmi, who organized multiple suicide bombings uh, against Israelis in the 1990s, and there were other pictures like that, and they're all on his social media posts. And of course, on October 7th, he was jubilant and talking about how, you know, mockingly about how the settlers were fleeing the uh, Gaza border region because they're being slaughtered by the resistance. So he was, you know, so he's a Hamas terror booster. And what was notable about Kawasmi is that on his own Twitter feed, he posted a picture of himself with the same crowd of teenagers in exactly the same position where he's being kicked. Um, except that in the picture that he posted of himself on his own ex account, he's the one who's kicking them. He's kicking this uh, redheaded uh, teenage boy in the groin. Okay, and then and then in the picture of the other uh, of the other student kicking him, um, the one who he showed himself kicking is in the back grimacing in pain or anger, pain, anger, whatever. So you have a situation where you say, okay, this guy posts repeatedly of himself on social media praising Hamas terrorists. And then he puts on his own ex account a picture of him kicking one of the boys. But the picture that made the rounds all around the world was him being kicked by one of the boys. Right. And this goes on all the time. There's this other guy from the Golan Heights who sent me this information. He said that his 23-year-old and 12-year-old came to Jerusalem with their yeshivot. And when they were in the tunnel uh, walking, to the, walking from the Damascus Gate to the Kotel, they were tear gassed by this leftist who was working with the Palestinians. There were a bunch of leftists who were trying to beat up the students. And then when the students responded, they were all documented attacking these Palestinians. And he said that when his kids you know, wailed on the, uh, actually it was an Arab who, who attacked them, they wailed on him. And then this group of leftists took a picture of them beating this poor Palestinian who had just tear gassed his son. So, you know, this goes on every, every, year. But in the case of Kawasmi, 
he's a he's a photographer for Al Jazeera as well. So like you look at this and you say, okay, so these are the journalists these are the, whose whose reports are then credited by the Washington Post, by the New York Times, by NBC, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, you know, whatever, and then the BBC and Sky News and and the Guardian and all of the rest of them as credible uh, sources of news. They produce fake data in terms of Palestinian uh, civilian casualties being killed by, Pal by, by the Israelis. They participate in atrocities, or holding uh, hostages, etc. They portray themselves as kicking Israeli civilians who are celebrating Jerusalem Day and so many other things. And yet they're presented, their accounts are presented as credible eyewitness accounts of Israeli atrocities time after time, whether it's in Judea and Samaria, in Jerusalem, in Gaza, or anywhere else. And yet what you see is that they themselves are proudly members of Hamas's terror nexus. It's, it's civilian, it's civilian militant nexus of terrorism that's directed entirely towards wiping Israel off the map, whether by seizing our history, discrediting our history, denying our history, uh, co-opting our history, uh, or killing us, uh, directly holding us captive, raping us, whatever it happens to be, which is why it can't surprise anybody, although it's always dismissed, but more Gaza civilians entered Israel on October 7th and engaged in the massacre of Israeli civilians and military forces and the abduction and rape of Israelis on that day than were conducted by the Gaza terrorists who were in uniform that day. All right. That's why it's so important to understand that. Because it's only when you recognize that this is a whole of Palestinian society assault on Israel, our military forces and our civilians, can you begin to understand, A, the scale of the threat they've posed to Israel as a society, right? And B, uh, the nature of the war that Israel's fighting, because that's the, th the one thing, the key issue that's being denied by Israel the international community, when they come to criminalize Israel, they're always uh, denying the nature of the war, that it's a whole of society war of annihilation that is being waged on every level, in every way, by Palestinian civilians and uniformed terrorists alike. And if you don't understand this, and if you refuse to communicate the nature of the war to your people, then you're complicit in the war crimes that are being carried out by Hamas and by its civilian accomplices, its civilian members in Gaza, in Judea and Samaria, and anywhere else on a daily basis as a matter of course, because that's the nature of Palestinian society. It's the reason why 85% of Palestinians support the atrocities of October 7th and support Hamas. It's because they are part, they are, they are a part of the same fabric. They are part of a fabric of a society that is genocidal and that is organized around the principle of genocide and annihilating and discrediting the Jewish people in Jewish history. Right? That that's that's a thing, that's a key insight that I wanted to take away from what we saw in the rescue. We see, on the one hand, Israelis are I mean, our our military is so heroic. And oh, that brings me to the last thing. So why is this important? Because for two reasons. One is because Israel is literally, I mean, it's shocking, but it is literally being accused of carrying out a massacre at Nusrat refugee camp on Saturday. Uh, Josep Borrell from Spain, who's the EU commissioner for foreign affairs, he put out a statement after the rescue accusing Israel of carrying out a wanton massacre of murdering 200 people. Okay, the, the people who came at IDF forces who were rescuing hostages who were being illegally held in a war crime for eight months and one day by civilians who worked for Hamas inside of the camp, right? They were all, according to international humanitarian law, they were terrorists because international humanitarian law has a principle of distinction where you have to separate civilians from military forces. And the Hamas's way of doing business, of carrying out its war against Israel, involves 
ignoring the, the issue of distinction and Palestinian society is based on hiding the distinction between civilians and terrorists, okay, of, of erasing the distinction so that the way that the society is organized by Hamas and, complic and with the complicity of the civilians who engage in acts of terrorist warfare against Israel while in civilian clothes, while acting as civilians, as part of carrying out their civilian lives of taking care of patients in your home clinic while holding Israeli hostages in your attic, right? These are not civilians. There is no distinction. And the people who are responsible for the deaths are the people themselves who were acting as Hamas terrorists and Hamas who engages the civilian population as part of, integrates them into its terrorist operation. And so here is Israel accused of massacring the people who are complicit with or actual accomplices to Hamas's illegal holding of Israeli hostages in Nusrat refugee camp and throughout the Gaza Strip, where 120 Israelis, 79 of whom are assessed as alive, are still being held today. So that's what we have to realize. And then the last thing that I want to talk about with you regarding the hostage rescue and what we learned from that is that Burrell, along with Tony Blinken and President Joe Biden, all said in the aftermath of the rescue, which they all provided faint praise for, that now we have to get back to the hostage negotiations that they're trying to force Israel to uh, acquiesce to with Hamas, which would see thousands of Hamas murderers released from Israeli prisons, a total cessation of the war while keeping this civilian military terrorist genocidal complex in place intact in Gaza. Right. That's the point of the ceasefire deal that they're trying to reach on the backs of our hostages, some of our hostages, only 33 out of the 79 who are alive. Right. Maybe in the best case scenario. That it, they want us to go back to those ceasefire deals, that those ceasefire talks. And here we have to understand who they want us to negotiate with, who Israel is being required by the Biden administration to negotiate these these this deal deals with. We're being asked to negotiate with Hamas. And again, what we see about Hamas is that this is a genocidal terrorist organization that is organized around the principle of genocide, and it is supported and aided by the population of Gaza itself. When you understand the nature of the enemy, as we saw so clearly yesterday and in the international community's response to the incredible rescue operation. We understand that this whole idea that Israel's information operations is so terrible and what we really need to do is to get better Hasbara, et cetera. It's, it's ignoring the main point here. The main point here is that it's not a lack of information. It's a denial of information. They don't want to acknowledge the truth because they support what Hamas is doing. Joseph Borrell is an anti-Semite. He supports Hamas. That's why Spain, his country, just recognized Palestine, right? Knowing full well that what they were doing was providing assistance to Hamas. That's why Spain just joined South Africa in charging Israel with genocide. It's all a lie. He knows it's a lie. He doesn't care that it's a lie. It's not that he doesn't have the information. It's that he's against the information because the information undermines his efforts to join Hamas in annihilating Israel. So these are the things that we have to take away from the raid. Israel is unbelievable. Our military is incredible. And by the way, the IDF says that 200 people were not killed there, and I would tend to believe them at, out of hand, you know, just because these people in Gaza lie about everything. So maybe 100 were killed. But who, right? And we have to understand that this is really a world war against the Jews. It's Hamas, it's Iran, it's Hezbollah, it's the Houthis, it's the Shiite militias in Iraq, in Syria, operating in Jordan. But it's also the West that is siding with them because they're attacking the Jews, because these people are anti-Semites, because they support what Hamas is doing. And once you recognize that, the New York Times, the Washington Post are colluding with this. They're part of it because they're lying about it on purpose, deliberately, with malice aforethought, I argue. And we, once you realize that, a lot of other things about the nature of this war also become clear, including the imperative Israeli victory. 
Take care. I'll talk to you later this week.